Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Victor. Thank you to the launch team. Um, I'm not used to standing behind a microphone. I like moving around, but I guess I'm stuck here. Um, I, I brought a couple of props, though, today before I start. Uh, today's USA Today. We're talking about energy. Wood heating fuel concerns. Wood heating in the United States is up about 30% um, nationwide uh, over the last few years, probably driven by the recession. Um, and I'll explain later why this next one, drought costs exceed $10 billion across the United States. That's important for energy. Uh, business page, the controversial pipeline is delayed. You probably heard about the Keystone Pipeline. Um, that's delayed. And then the uh, eco-friendly uh, civic natural gas vehicle is being um, rolled out across the country. So um, energy is with us and it's always in the news. It's great that I teach a class at USC in energy, and it's always great because every, every week I can pull something out of the newspaper. Um, so Victor asked me to talk a little bit about how, we, how I, I rethink energy, and hopefully um, uh, it'll give you some insights as well. In a previous life, I used to do price and demand forecasting, and I was pretty good at it. Um, but as you probably know, that's a pretty hard job because most people are really bad at it. You know, if you've got a good batting average, you would certainly never make it out of single A. Um, sorry if you're not a baseball fan or you don't know baseball, but that's the really low minor leagues. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to talk about what I think the future of energy is, and I realize there's a risk to that because it's being taped in 10 years from now. Some may say, hey, you were wrong, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm going to channel George Carlin for a minute because there is a a reason why you should believe me, you should believe me because I'm an innovator and I'm a visionary and I'm ahead of my time. Uh, problem is I'm only about an hour and a half ahead of my time. So, um, it, let me go to the past first. In the past, we some people did a pretty good job of forecasting the future of energy. Uh, the very first forecast was done by the Resources for the Future. Um, they did it in 1960 and predicted out to 1985. And a couple of the researchers had the guts in 1985 to actually stand up and say how they did. And it turns out, if you think about 1960 to 1985 in the United States energy, lots of things happened in between that period of time. Uh, oil price shocks, uh, Three Mile Island. They were spot on with their total demand forecast in 1985. But everything underlying it, all the assumptions, all the pieces were all wrong. It just so happens they totaled it up and added right, but everything else was wrong. Um, so you could have one success on one hand and not success on the other hand. Um, the other place that regularly gets you energy information is Lawrence Livermore Labs. Um, they do the uh, energy flow diagrams for the United States. You've probably seen them. You can actually go back and see them from the 1960s. And if you and, and back in 78, they did a forecast to 1990. Um, on demand, and they overshot demand by 80%. They were really far off. So it just gives you some sense as to how difficult it is. And we've been really bad at predicting change in energy. And why? Because for the last 40 years, things really haven't changed. So everybody who says, you know, predicts we're gonna, things are going to change in the energy business, if you go back those flow diagrams for the last 40 years, or you look at the mix of energy use in the United States for the last 40 years, it really hasn't changed. We added more stuff here and there, but the general mix of energy use and how we use energy hasn't changed very much. It's all variations on a theme. Um, the first paper I wrote in graduate school, which was some time ago, was on the barriers to commercialization of fuel cells. I could take that paper today, just change the date on it, and plop it in front of you. Thought I would have wrote it yesterday. So the things, except for one of the fuel cell companies who's here today, um, things haven't changed very much uh, in it. <clears throat> so the question is, why do I think things are going to change in the next 40 years? Since the last 40 years hasn't changed much, why are they going to change for the next 40 years? Well, there are a couple of fundamental things that are changing. First is costs. Costs are shifting. You know, we've had, we had very stable, relatively stable costs, even though we had price spikes here and there. Um, and resource availability is going to be very different. You know, the type of energy we have, the type of resource we have is changing. We know that. We can see that. We know the climate is changing. Uh, and we see that every day. The other big factor that I think is leading to it is our consumers' expectations are changing. How consumers interact with energy and interact 
um, with the things that they use has been changing as well. And lastly, actually not lastly, second to last, is uh, innovation. Um, we're going to see some really good innovations here. And why I believe energy innovation is changing um, is not so much because some new brilliant ideas are coming out, but because who is coming up with those new brilliant ideas? Um, I work with a number of folks on, on different energy and, and environmental related things. And in the past, it was mostly engineers. Today, I'm working with a microbiologist, a marine biologist, um, some chemists, some economists, and an historian. I can explain individually why I'm working with a historian. But not, no engineers. Used to be all the energy technology development were driven by engineers. Now they're being driven by a broader set of folks with different ideas bringing innovation to the play. And the last thing that I think is going to drive changes in energy is water. Um, we all know that um, we use a lot of energy in water. In California, about 25% of all electricity use goes to water. In the country as a whole, 10% of all energy use in the United States goes to water. Whether it's moving the water, whether it's cleaning it before you use it, whether it's what you do to use it, like heating it, um, cleaning it after you use it, and getting rid of it. Well, that's the most energy intensive industry in the United States that nobody really pays attention to. And then on the flip side, there's a lot of water used in the energy system. Thermoelectric power plants, biofuels, solar thermal facilities, they all use water and significant amounts of water. And that's caused problems too. If you remember the heat wave in Europe um, in uh, uh, about 10, 12 years ago, um, nuclear power plants in France had to cut back production by almost 25% because the water coming from the rivers were too warm to cool, and they couldn't send it back in the river too hot, so they had a capacity in the middle of a summertime heat wave. Not that there's a lot of air conditioning in France anyway, but whatever air conditioning they did have was getting shut off. Um, so there is that relationship. So the, the energy water connection, and then you add the climate factor into that, and what you get is you get water changes, so we're changing the availability of water. So what do we do about that? Well, we make new water. We either desalinate it or we clean it and reuse it. That takes a lot more energy. Every new acre foot of water we try to use takes a lot more energy, whether it's going to be pumping from further away, deeper under the ground, or clean it. Well, OK, so we're going to use more energy to make the water. And that more energy is going to cause more climate change, unless we're going to do it with renewables. And therefore, that climate change is going to cause more water problems. And we keep going in a cycle. And I think what's going to end up happening is we're going to break, need to break that cycle. I know about three coal plants in the United States that are in places in the drought that if they don't do something soon, they're going to have to begin to shut down, not because of carbon emissions, but because they can't get the water. Um, and that's going to be an issue. So what I think the future of energy and the problem which I'm going to tell you is is that I said this 20 years ago, but the technology wasn't ready 20 years ago. Today it is, which is moving much more towards a decentralized distributed energy system, um, bringing energy back um, to the people. Um, and that's being driven by these factors. Economies of scale are gone in energy. And I've, I said that a long time ago. We begin to see it. It doesn't make any sense to build big, giant facilities. You can't borrow the money, number one. Number two is the banana syndrome. You've heard of NIMBY, but the next one is banana. Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody. Um, you know, Try to cite something, not just in the United States. Try to cite something places else. You just can't cite something big. Um, we can't cite transmission lines. We can't cite, cite big facilities. So it's, it's really a situation where you've got to go small. It's cheaper, it's more efficient, and the new technology is emerging. And the last piece that I really think is going to change it is, and we see that in, in a couple of the companies here, is giving people more control over their energy systems. Um, there, a couple of years ago, there was an article in National Geographic that did a really great piece on um, energy efficiency and um, Peter Miller and his family trying to reduce their carbon diet. Um, and he had a quote, he said, we already know the fastest, least expensive way to slow climate change. Use less energy. 
With a little effort and not much money, most of us could reduce our energy diets by 25% or more. So what is holding us back? And the answer to what is holding us back, or most people back, is the lack of information and the lack of control. And if we can give people information, you know, I believe, regardless of the fact that the average American public, I kind of don't agree with what they watch on television, um, or maybe they're not that clued into other things, when it comes to personal responsibility, when it comes to personal finances, people actually take action. And it's been shown that if we give people better information about things they do, they actually make more efficient choices. And some of the literature tells us we could make a 20% reduction in average energy use by households just by giving people more information and more control. So seeing these things happen as people get more control over their own energy and water and other things, as people, as these technologies begin to emerge, we reshape the industry. The electric utility industry in the United States is not a growth industry. It's going to be a reshaping industry, rethinking how we make, how we use, how we develop energy. I work with a number of companies getting to think about how they hedge risk against future energy prices by being self-sufficient. You know, have control of your own energy system. That's going to change, and we see that changing other places. We also see it changing this ability to leap over to a new technology. We've seen that in telecommunications in the developing world. Right? When I first worked in Africa a long time ago, if I needed to make a telephone call back to the United States, you had to make an appointment at the post office, um, and it was usually a you know, one to two week wait to make an appointment to go make a phone call. If you want to get a landline in many of those countries, you know, it was multi-year waits to get a landline. Well, now people all over the place have cell phones. You jumped over the technology of, of wires, to with the new technology and now the telecommunications and ability are easier, we got to do the same thing in energy. Um, when I was doing the work in Africa, and I was talking about that 20 years ago, um, the technology wasn't ready to do it. I mean, it was the thing we had to do, but the technology wasn't there. It's there today. Wireless, um, disconnected energy systems that are clean and reliable are here today. In the next two days, we're going to be seeing a bunch of companies that have these ideas in mind and have these ideals. Um, so I find it's going to be very exciting. Um, and I'm looking forward to working with everybody and talking to you and helping you and everybody else rethink how we look at energy. I'll give you one last quote from another great American philosopher who's kind of before my time. I learned this from my parents, George Goebel. He's a comedian philosopher. And he said, if it weren't for electricity, we'd all be watching television by candlelight. Have a good time, everybody.